Hi, everyone. This is Angela Ciolana, one of the hosts of Journeys of Hope. Thanks so much for downloading this Pilgrim Center of Hope podcast. And we are so grateful to our sponsor who made this podcast possible in honor of Valentin, Nicholas, and Francisco Campos. If you also would like to join us as a missionary of hope in this mission, please visit pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Now, here is your journey of hope. Journeys of Hope, an introduction to the Universal Church that promotes an attitude of pilgrimage among the faithful by introducing you to pilgrim destinations around the world. Welcome to Journeys of Hope. This is your spiritual passport to sacred destinations around the world, placing you in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, the Apostles, and the Saints. I am Mary Jane Fox. My husband, Deacon Tom Fox, and I co-direct Pilgrim Center of Hope, an evangelization ministry founded in 1993 with the mission of guiding people to Christ and the Church through presentations on living and sharing our Christian faith, media, conferences, and another part of the ministry of the Pilgrim Center of Hope is organizing customized and unique pilgrimages. These are journeys of faith to various destinations marked through history where people have been renewed in their spiritual lives, where they have been healed and enriched in their faith. For the last 28 years, Pilgrim Center of Hope has led well over 70 authentic spiritual pilgrimages to the Holy Land, Italy, France, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Germany, Marian apparition sites, and beyond. As a result, Journeys of Hope is able to take you to these holy sites. Come on a journey with me today to Assisi, Italy. You have heard the name of this town, Assisi, a small town made by famous, made, actually made famous by two people, Francis and Claire, who lived here in the 13th century. There is so much to learn about Saints Francis and Claire their town of Assisi, their experiences, and the Franciscan spirituality. Well, this is part two of a three-part series on Assisi. Today, in this second part of our Journeys of Hope series, we will visit the Basilica of St. Clair that contains the tomb of Clare, of course. You will be also introduced to Clare and learn how she met Francis and how she decided to leave her wealthy family to follow Christ. Both Saints Francis and Claire have been instrumental in inspiring and teaching thousands of people through the centuries. Who was Saint Claire? Were her and Francis close friends? What did she experience to leave everything and begin a community of women willing to follow the way Christ in a radical way that would attract women of all walks of life? In part one of this series, we learn about this medieval town, uh, this medieval town, uh, a site that has a history of over 3,000 years. Christianity was introduced to the villagers of Assisi in the 3rd century by St. Rufino, who also became the first bishop. The medieval architecture has remained untouched for centuries. Assisi was made famous for being the birthplace of St. Francis, the patron saint of Italy, the founder of the Franciscan order, and the birthplace of St. Clair. In this 70 square miles of cobblestone streets and quaint homes, there are seven churches. The two most popular are the two which contain the tombs of Francis and Clair. They are the Basilica of St. Francis and the Basilica of St. Clair. In part one, we visited the incredible Basilica of St. Francis. Today, we will visit the Basilica of St. Clair that houses her tomb and the original icon crucifix that spoke to Francis, called the San Damiano Cross. But first, let us meet Clare. Clare was born in Assisi on July 16, 1194. Her full name was Chiera Ofredocio. She was the eldest daughter. Her parents came from a wealthy family. In fact, her father held the title of Count, 
a historical title of nobility in certain European countries. Her mother was a devout Catholic and taught her children the faith. Claire embraced the faith, and already, beginning at a young age, she would spend a lot of time in prayer. When she was 18 years old, she attended a Lenten service at the local church where Francis was preaching. She was so inspired by his presentation on the gospel message that she approached, she approached Francis and asked him to help her live according to the gospel. What spontaneity from a young woman! Francis' charism of preaching would touch the depth of those who heard him preach. It was a gift given to him by God, whom he loved so much. Can you imagine how it must have been at, at, during that Lenten service, hearing this young man speak so eloquently about God, about his mercy, as he stood in front of the congregation in his brown tunic, which became the Franciscan habit? Well, this is what happened to Claire. Her docility to the message of the Gospels touched her so deeply, and as she heard the good news of our Savior, she also saw a joy in Francis and his love for Christ and the church. When they met, Francis was 30 years old and Claire was 18. Claire's father, the Count, had made plans for his beautiful daughter to marry a rich young nobleman. But Claire, who had given her heart completely to Jesus, already as a young teenager, was determined not to marry. Claire knew her father had a stubborn streak and a hot temper. She knew her father wouldn't allow her to become a a follower of Christ as a consecrated woman. So, after meeting secretly with Francis about what to do, she and her cousin slipped out of her home in the middle of the night on March 20th, which was Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. They went to the place where Francis and his, and his companions prayed. Near, and this was where he actually lived. It, there, nearby, there were some humble hermitages where Francis and, and his companions lived. When she arrived, they prayed and they sang hymns praising God. Then Claire, Claire then laid aside her rich dress and in its place received a symbol, a very simple rough tunic and a thick veil. Then Francis cut her long blonde hair, and in this way, the young Claire vowed herself to the service of Jesus Christ. This happened on March 20th of 1212. When it was known at home what Claire had done, her father and relatives came to rescue her. She resisted fearlessly when they tried to drag her away. In fact, she clung to the altar so firmly that when they grabbed her and tried to pull her away, they almost pulled her clothes off. Her relatives gave in, and she told them she had given her life to Christ and his service. She would have no other spouse. It was Christ she had chosen. So Francis took Claire to a nearby convent of Benedictine nuns to live a contemplative life. When her father found out what happened, he went to Claire and attempted to force her back home once again. She refused and professed that she would have no other husband than Jesus Christ. This was her new life. Her sister, Agnes, was so inspired by all this that she too joined her sister Claire, and she was only 14 years old when she embraced this contemplative life. Well, after some time, Francis moved Claire and her sister Agnes from the Benedictine convent and placed them in a small and humble convent adjacent to his beloved church of San Damiano on the outskirts of Assisi. When Claire was about 22, Francis appointed her superior and gave her his rule of life to live by. They were called the Poor Clares. She was soon joined by her mother and several other women and they became a number of 16 in total. They had all felt the strong appeal of poverty and sackcloth, and without regret gave up their titles, their estates, to become Claire's humble companions, called the Poor Claire Sisters. Well, within a few years, similar comments were founded in the Italian cities of Perugia, Padua, Rome, Venice, Milan, Siena, and Pisa, and also in various parts of France and Germany. 
It went even as far as Prague. The daughter of the king of Bohemia in Prague established a poor Clare nunnery of this order and took the habit herself. What was the rule of life that, what was the rule li- like, um, or what, maybe I should say, what was the rule of life that Claire wrote? Well, it was based on the foundation of Franciscan poverty and simplicity of life. Claire added the contemplative vision, bringing a unique gift to the church. The combination of evangelical poverty and community was Claire's legacy to her sisters and the church. They lived in, in faith with silence and solitude of the contemplative life within this enclosed community. She would tell her sisters, gaze upon him, consider him, contemplate him as you desire to imitate him. This really sums up their life. But what was their daily life like? Well, they lived a monastic life, which is simple and yet profound. Everything is directed to God in, pr- in prayer, worship, and some labor. The poor Clares wore rough, coarse habits, went barefoot, slept on the ground, observed a perpetual abstinence from meat, and spoke only when obligated to do so by necessity or charity. Claire herself considered this silence important, like a virtue, for keeping the mind steadily fixed on God. They would rise early in the morning for community prayer, followed by adoration of Jesus in the Eucharist. When they gathered for their simple meals, they would sit at the long wooden table. They would stop several times during the day through the evening for community prayer. It was a life of contemplative prayer, of peace, and of joy. Claire governed the convent continuously from the day when Francis appointed her the superior until her death, which is a period of nearly 40 years. Yet it was her desire always to be beneath all the rest, serving at the table, tending the sick, washing and kissing the feet of the sisters when they went when they returned from begging. Her modesty and humility were, were such that after caring for the sick and praying for them, she would be the first to rise, ring the bell in the choir, and light the candles, and she would come away from prayer with radiant face. Claire herself went beyond and added additional mortifications, such as wearing a rough shirt shirt of hair under her habit, which was very uncomfortable. She fasted every day in Lent, on bread and water, and on some days ate nothing. Francis and the Bishop of Assisi sometimes had to command her to take a little nourishment and rest. She suffered serious illness for the last 27 years of her life. Her wisdom and influence was such that popes, cardinals, and bishops often came to consult her. Claire herself never left the walls of San Damiano. Imagine popes, cardinals, and bishops coming to her to consult her and to gain her wisdom. So much did she have of this gift of wisdom because of the result of her prayer and a gift that God had given her. Francis uh, always remained a great friend and inspiration. Claire was always obedient to his will and, and to the great ideal of, of gospel life, which he was living fully. He was like a spiritual father for her and helped her establish the first female Franciscan order. When Francis died in the year 1226, Claire was only 32 years old. They had a deep spiritual friendship. The few times they did meet, they spoke about God, their prayer life, the needs of the community. They would praise God together. They were so united in this way. When Francis died, Claire was deeply saddened, of course, but she was also joyful. She knew her dear friend reached his destination, the eternal life. Claire's deep union with the Lord and her persistent prayers were often rewarded by miracles. Twice, God saved the poor Claire convent through the intercession of St. Clair. The first time was in the fall of 1240. Claire was 46 years old at this time and, and still the mother superior of the convent. A large group of Saracen soldiers attacked the walls of the monastery. Were, were, they were planning to attack the walls of the monastery on their way to the city of Assisi to take it over. 
The poor Clare Monastery was around a mile outside the city walls of Assisi. Her sisters ran to her and wondered what to do. These men would attack the monastery and ransack it. Clare told the sisters to pray to Jesus and have total confidence in him. Then Clare went to the small oratory, that small chapel next to her dormitory, opened the tabernacle where the Blessed Sacrament was kept. She took the Blessed Sacrament and walked to the one window in this chapel and placed the Blessed Sacrament on the windowsill. Then she and the sisters fell on their knees and Clare begged God to save them. Clare told the sisters, Have no fear, little daughters. Trust in Jesus. Suddenly, the Saracens retreated. While well, this story is told today still by the Franciscans in Assisi and is referred to as a Eucharistic miracle story. What would you have done in a case like that? Well, this proves the power of prayer. It proves the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. How can anyone doubt that the Eucharist is truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ? I believe this is a remarkable story to be told repeatedly to encourage us in our faith and hope. I have been to that convent chapel and stood in the front of that stone-framed window facing the entrance of the convent and recall this extraordinary Eucharistic miracle story. That is why when you see a statue of St. Clair, she is often represented holding a monstrance with the Blessed Sacrament in it. The second miracle occurred the following year in 1241 when a similar situation occurred when troops from another region attacked Assisi. Again, her deep devotion to the Eucharist brought her before the Blessed Sacrament, and again, the city of Assisi was spared. Oh, there were so many other miracles. But Claire experienced her own multiplication of the loaves when she fed 50 sisters and all the Franciscan friars with a single loaf of bread. Once, a very heavy door came off its hinges and fell on top of her. And when the, the, a number of sisters in panic rushed to lift it off, instead of finding her crushed, she was not harmed at all and said, she said, it felt no heavier than a blanket. <laughs> the sick were cured when she made the sign of the cross over them. At times when she meditated, the sisters saw a rainbow aura surrounding her. One Christmas Eve, Claire was too ill to attend Mass at the New Basilica of St. Francis. Although she was more than a mile away, she saw Mass on the wall of her dormitory. It was so, so clear was this vision that the next day she told her sisters she could name the friars at the celebration. It was for this miracle that she has been named Patron Saint of Television. Clara was the first Franciscan woman, a follower of St. Francis. Together, they founded the second order of the Franciscan family, the Poor Clares. The St. Clara was sick and suffered great pains for many years, but she said that she had no, that really no pain could trouble her. So great was her joy in, in serving the Lord, she once exclaimed, They say that we are too poor, but can a heart which possesses the infinite God be truly called poor? She lived in the church of San Damiano which, for about, well, 40 years until her death. She died in 1253 at the age of 59, and on her deathbed she said, Go forth without fear, Christian soul, for you have a good guide for your journey. Go forth without fear, for he that created you has sanctified you, has always protected you, and loves you as his own. What a consoling and encouraging greeting from a spiritual mother to her sisters. But it's a consoling and encouraging greeting for us today. When we think about it, we must go forth without fear. Jesus said in the Gospels, Fear is useless. What is needed is trust. Now that we have met Claire, let's visit the basilica named after her and the convent where she lived, which is called San Damiano. When Claire died, her body was buried, but then Pope Alexander IV canonized her in the year 1255, only two years after her death, very similar to that of Francis, who was also canonized two years after his death. But a few years later, her body was to be moved to the basilica built in her honor. 
they found her body to be incorrupt. Her body was placed in a glass conf- in a glass coffin for all to see. But by the 19th century, when a new crypt was built for her remains um, underneath this basilica of St. Clair, it was discovered that Claire's body was still incorrupt, although it had darkened through the centuries. In time, St. Clair's remains began to deteriorate, so a mask made of wax was constructed to cover her face, which was soon reduced to bones. The mask, which was as close as possible to her facial features, can be seen by the public today while her actual relics, her bones, can be seen only by the sisters who have access to the rear of the crypt. The Basilica of St. Clair has two levels, the main level and the crypt, now where, where, Saint Clair bo- where her body is, is entombed. The construction work on the church began, like we said, just a couple of years after her death and a year after she was canonized. The exterior of the building makes use of the alternate strips of the pink and white stones with massive supporting arches on either side. So it's quite different from the Basilica of St. Francis. Um, the interior has the, same, has the same layout as the upper Basilica of St. Francis with a single nave, um, the main aisle. So as you walk in to the right side is an open, is an entrance to the Chapel of the Crucifix. Here is the original icon crucifix that, Fra- that Francis found in the very small chapel in the countryside. There are a few wooden pews in the chapel, and the crucifix hangs from the ceiling, but low enough so that you can kneel below it and see the details clearly. But before we go any further, let's look at this crucifix named the San Damiano Cross. And again, that's really the only thing in this chapel besides the main altar, uh, the, the wooden pews, the altar rail, where you could actually kneel at this um, marble altar rail. It's, uh, at, at this very cl- and it's very cold it's, it's, uh, when you kneel on the stone uh, uh, altar rail and you look up to the San Damiano crucifix. It's, it, that's really the main focus as you enter this chapel. The interior has this... Um, so as we go on to the, uh, the icon of the San Damiano... It was painted in the region of Umbria in the 12th century. The artist remains unknown. It's seven feet long by four and a half feet wide. It's made of pecan wood. And the image itself is not painted on the wood, but on a canvas that is adhered directly to the wood. And it's remained on the wood since then. It is painted in a style popular at the time that served to teach the meaning of the event depicted, which is the crucifixion, and thereby strengthening the faith of the people who would see it. Because remember, at that time, many people could not read or write. So the uh, icons, sacred imagery, sacred art that was um, used in the basilicas, sacred stained glass windows, and so, um, were actually used to teach the faith. So let's examine the image on this cross. The largest figure is Jesus Christ, represented both as wounded and strong, standing upright and resolute. The bright white of the Lord's body contrasts with the dark red and black around it. So it highlights the prominence of Jesus. His body is is pierced by nails in the hands and feet and by the soldier's lance on his side. The next largest figure are the five witnesses of the crucifixion. On the left side are the Virgin Mary and St. John the Evangelist, to whom Jesus entrusted his mother. On the right side are Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, and the centurion, who in the Matthew's Gospel called, asked Jesus to heal his son. Both Mary and Mary Magdalene have their hands placed on their cheeks to reflect extreme grief and anguish. They're all standing at the foot of the cross. The three smaller figures are represented as witnessing the crucifixion. On the lower left is Longinus, the traditional name of the Roman soldier who pierced the side of Jesus with a lance. In the lower right is the soldier who offered Jesus the the sponge soaked in vinegar wine. And a smaller figure next to that that we really quite can't make out. At both ends of the crossbar are six angels. Their hands gesture in um, 
they gesture indicating they are discussing this crucifixion of the Lord and calling us to marvel with them. See, already, this is what an icon does. It's The icon is, is an um, it's sacred art inviting us to contemplate the mystery, in this case, the mystery of the crucifixion. On the top of the cross, one sees a smaller figure of Jesus, now fully clothed in his majestic garments and carrying the cross as a triumphant staff. He is climbing out of the tomb and into the heavenly courts. This represents, of course, a resurrection. Ten angels are crowded around, five of whom have their hands extended in a welcoming gesture to Jesus, who he himself has his hand raised in a form of a greeting. At the very top of the cross is the hand of God with two fingers extended. This is to be understood as the blessing of God the Father on the sacrifice of his Son. And the entire icon is bordered by a series of shells. Now these shells express the supernatural and eternal characteristic of what is painted within its frame. The shell has also been a symbol of new life and of baptism. You often see shells um, depicted in sacred art during the medi- uh, from the medieval ages as well. What is interesting about this crucifix is that there is no crown of thorns on the Lord's head. Rather, in its place is a golden halo inscribed to the cross. This should remind us of the scripture from Hebrews chapter 2, where we read that Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, we now see crowned with glory and honor, and because of the death he suffered, that by grace of God he might taste death for everyone. The eyes are large and open, which confirms that Christ, who had died upon the cross, is alive. Death no longer has power over him. The arms of Jesus, despite their suffering, are stretched out as a sign of welcome. The legs are strong. They hold up the body in a vertical position. This way of standing indicates that Jesus is powerful and he announces God's victory over death. This is the icon crucifix called the San Damiano Cross. St. Francis prayed before this crucifix. Even Claire prayed before this icon during her time. And this uh, this icon enlightened the spiritual growth of St. Claire and her sisters in San Damiano. In its presence, St. Claire and her companions live their call to holiness on the contemplative path. We just learned about the San Damiano crucifix, the icon cross that spoke to Francis. He heard cries from this cross say, Francis, rebuild my church. When St. Francis would enter into a church, he would say this prayer that he composed himself. We adore you, most holy Lord Jesus Christ, here and in all of your churches around the world. And when we praise you, we praise you because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Does that sound familiar? Well, maybe so, because today when we pray the Stations of the Cross, this prayer was shortened between each station to, We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, for by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. It is a prayer to learn and say often before a crucifix. We can understand why Francis admired this icon crucifix. Francis wrote a prayer to discern God's will, and today this prayer is printed in various languages and placed at the feet of the original San Damiano cross here in the Basilica of St. Clair for all to read and pray from the heart as they contemplate the gaze of the Lord's eyes upon them. And here is that prayer. Most high, glorious God, enlighten the darkness of my heart. Give me true faith, certain hope, and perfect charity sense and knowledge that I may carry out your holy and true command. For myself and pilgrim groups, my husband and I lead to Assisi, we especially like to spend quiet time here in this humble chapel, praying before this crucifix, and also to ponder how it must have been for Francis when he first saw this, this icon crucifix over 800 years ago. But we must leave this chapel now and continue our visit of the Basilica of St. Clair. And as we exit the chapel of the crucifix, a few steps to the right is the stairway to the crypt. At its interest, entrance is a desk where a poor Claire nun welcomes you. She receives your written petitions and distributes prayer cards of St. Clair. Let's go downstairs to the crypt. 
To the right lies the body of St. Clair, and to the left is the large gallery of relics, items that belong to both Francis and Clair. Let's first go see where St. Clair lies. The lighting is a bit dimmer here in respect of St. Clair's tomb. The entrance towards her tomb is circular, beginning to the right. Along the walls are icons of Claire's lives, life. One of, it, of the panels is of Francis cutting the long blonde hair of Claire. Another is one of Claire clutching the altar as her father and relatives try to force her to return home. Each panel tells of her life, and they're so interesting. We come to the stop in the middle. A perpetual candle burns on the wall, and there is a large glass window where you can actually look in and see a glass coffin of Claire. Since her body's no longer incorrupt since the 19th century, although her skeleton is in perfect condition, she's covered in a wax likeness of her and dressed in the habit of her order, the poor Claire's. We have time to stop here and glance upon the saint's tomb while asking her intercession. And I remember when when I stood at that very spot, I thanked God for this opportunity, and I thanked him to, to have learned so much about this incredible woman, and also to ask Claire to pray for not only myself, but for all the people I carried in my heart, that we may all remain faithful to the gospel message. Upon exiting, we go to the other side, to the Gallery of Relics. Now, relics are physical objects that have direct association with the saints or with our Lord. They are usually broken down into three classes. First-class relics are body or fragments of the body of a saint, such as pieces of wood, hair, or flesh, sometimes even blood. Second-class relics or something that a saint personally owned, such as a shirt, a book, shoes, or fragments of those items. Third-class relics are those items that a saint touched or that have been touched to a first-class relic. I always say Catholics, you know, we as Catholics get excited about relics <laughs> because, it, you know, it really says, it tells us so much about the person, the individual, and we are honoring them as um as a as symbols uh, of their of their virtues of the, how they live their lives, and here we see first and second class relics of Claire and a few of Francis. Claire's long blonde hair can be seen; it's kept in a glass reliquary. The simple worn shoes of Francis, Claire's tunic, the socks she made for Francis, which had holes in them because <laughs> he wore them out and numerous other items. And to me, it is, it is so exciting to see such things. When we admire a person, we want to learn about them. And these items were well-preserved by their friends and companions. So glad they did, so now we can appreciate them today. As we return to the upper level, the main level, the Blessed Sacrament Chapel is located to the left of the main altar. This is the Basilica of St. Clair, simple and yet profound for what it offers. Let us now go to her convent, located outside the, um, about a mile um, outside the ancient city walls of Assisi. It's one of my favorite places to visit because it hasn't changed much since the time of Clare. Her convent is next to the little chapel Francis found in his early years. Here he heard the voice of Christ from the cross tell him, Francis, rebuild my church. He did both physically and spiritually, by leading many souls to Christ and the Church. The place is called San Damiano. It is the first dwelling of the poor Clares, and here Clare lived most all her life. Here, Francis also composed the Canticle of Creatures, a hymn of gratitude of, to God. Let's explore this holy site, situated on one of the hills that surround the Assisi walls. The walk from the parking area is a few yards, and as you walk towards the sanctuary, we see the beautiful green valley with scattered vineyards and olive trees. A bronze sculpture of Francis sits between the walkway and the edge of the hill. The sculpture is of Francis sitting, looking out into the valley. It's quite unique. It is here where Francis, at the age of 24, stayed for some time and, as I said, had composed the Canticle of Creatures. We are in front of the sanctuary, which is 
most of the original buildings from the time of Clare. It looks like a square-shaped area, and in the middle is, is a courtyard. And so you have the church, her convent, and uh, where where they had uh, their dining area. So let's let's begin by going into the entrance leading to the main church. But first, uh, the, the, well, first of all, the original church dating back to four or five centuries before St. Francis is marked by the medieval restoration he himself completed. So and then when Francis was rebuilding this chapel, there was also a priest house nearby. It was very simple, very small, and it was here where Francis at the age of 24 stayed for some time. And um, it was here where Claire came at the age of 18 to become a follower of Francis. She would live out her life, her love for Christ for 42 years in poverty and joy uh, in the Franciscan manner, which was very simple. Here in, in 1225, two years before his death, Francis spent time and wrote the Canticle of, Cre uh, of Creatures at this time. He had already received the wounds of the stigmata. And here upon Francis's death, which occurred on October 4th, 1226, the friar should bring his body to receive its last farewell from Claire and her sisters. As we enter a narrow stone entrance, we immediately enter a very small chapel called the Chapel of St. Jerome. This part, which used to be a small entity with the main chapel next to it, uh, is also important because not only was it situated beside the church, and separated from the convent, but this is where the, the priest's quarters would be. It was here that Francis spent an entire month hiding from his father um, uh, as an elderly priest lived here and welcomed Francis. And this was when Francis left his father and, and that dramatic breakup where he gives back his clothes to his father, even the clothes he was wearing, and proclaimed that the, hev his, the Heavenly Father was now his father. And besides the name of San Damiano, this has also been referred to as the Church of the Conversion of St. Francis for that reason. And from that time, Claire moved in with, with her sisters, um, well, actually, from the time Claire moved in with her sisters, this small little place was where Francis would stay when he came to see Claire. And now we leave this little tiny area through a door leading into the church, the heart of the entire sanctuary. Immediately, we are attracted to a small wooden altar area called the sanctuary around the main altar and the tabernacle. In the middle is an ancient stone column and a tabernacle sits on top of it, which is made of brass and wood. Here, Francis would kneel and pray, We adore you, O Lord Jesus Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. And today the Blessed Sacrament remains in this tabernacle with a red candle burning nearby. It's an active church used by the Franciscan friars who now take care of the sacred place. We continue by passing the altar and out to an enclosed area called the Little Choir, a square-shaped room with a couple of windows. The wooden furnishings are of individual stalls where the sisters sat, and, and they're made of simple dark wood. I mean, they're very simple. They're made of dark wood. And here at midnight, the sisters would wake up, go he come here, and pray their divine office. This is the heart of the convent. It tells us how prayer took the place of honor here, both prayer of praise of listening, intercessions, and contemplation. The large wooden lectern has a parchment with the names of the 50 sisters who were identified as being the first sisters here with Claire, and reading their names make them appear as though they were still present. So let's go to the upper floor. Uh, to the right, there's a very old staircase made of stone and worn by the many who have taken these steps from this area to the next to um, which leads us to the oratory. But before we get to the top, uh, where the oratory is located, there is a window at the top of the staircase looking out into the rooftop garden. It is said that Clara grew roses and violets here. She used to say to her sisters, when you see beautiful trees, leaved and in flower, you should praise God. And similarly, when you see men and other creatures, you should always, of all things and in all things, praise God. Now we are on the upper level and we enter the oratory. An oratory is a small chapel used for private prayer. The first part of the word ora, O-R-A, is Latin for prayer. 
then this small oratory was used by Claire for contemplative prayer. The Eucharist was kept is, is still was kept here as well, and it was here when she remained in prolonged prayer during her long illnesses when she couldn't go down to the main church. Two healings occurred through the intercession of St. Clair here when she made the sign of the cross over sick persons. And as we're facing the front of this oratory, to our left in the corner is a small window with a, small, with a stone frame. It is here where Claire placed the Eucharist when the Saracens were about to attack them and Assisi. The next room we enter is the large room with a brick floor and stone walls. There's a small fireplace at one end and a couple of windows. It is bare and austere. Here the sisters and Claire herself would sleep on straw mattresses. They would suffer the biting cold winter and suffer the heat of the summer. It was here Claire used to encourage her sisters to wake up at midnight to pray and praise God. And here Claire would embroider linen and silk for churches. And it was here when she experienced the miracle on Christmas Eve, she saw the entire midnight mass that was being offered in a different church. One corner is smart and robed off. It is in this corner where Claire would sleep and lie during her illness, and it is in this corner where she died. It is the farthest from the fireplace, and here, of course, she died about seven, but it was about 27 years after Francis's death. When my husband and I lead pilgrim groups here, we spend time walking through this entire sanctuary of San Damiano, and most especially like to spend time where Claire prayed, where she died. And as we leave this part of the sanctuary, we enter a courtyard with stone archways. To one side is the infirmary, where sisters were cared for when sick. On the other side is the dining room where Claire and the sisters ate and met together, where they would receive visitors. It still has its original wooden furnishings. Some miracles occurred here. The miracle of the 50 slices of bread, when the convent only had one loaf of bread. The miracle of the loaves marked with the sign of the cross, when Claire blessed them on the insistence of her guest, Pope Gregory the Ninth. The dining room was also placed was the place where Claire welcomed cardinals and the Pope when they came to wish um, to to meet her and to actually receive her her wisdom, uh, her counsel. <laughs> there was a famous incident which occurred in July of 1228 when, after the canonization of Saint Francis, Pope Gregory came here and he was moved by their vow of poverty. He wanted to encourage them to accept some earthly possessions. He, he heard Claire reply, Under no circumstances and never for all eternity do I wish to be dispensed from following the poor Christ. So Claire was referring to the privilege of holy poverty, which she embraced. You can observe they lived a radical penitential life, structured and filled with prayer, praise, but filled with peace. As we, live this, as we leave the sanctuary and return to the small plaza by the main entrance, we see a statue of Claire holding a monstrance with the Blessed Sacrament, reminding us of the Eucharistic miracle story that occurred here. Oh, there are numerous stories that occurred here. The companions of Francis and poor Claire's sisters have related these through the centuries, and they have been documented. And today, the Franciscan friars continue to tell those stories, and they have been written so we can enjoy them and learn more about Francis and Claire. Here is one story straight from Assisi, as told by one of the Franciscan friars. It is titled, The Will of God. And this is the story. Francis was accustomed to go to Claire for counsel and, and advice. She was the source of such enlightenment that Francis saw in her a reflection of the divine wisdom. As the moon receives the glory of its brightness from the sun, Claire received her splendor from the grace of God. Whenever Francis wanted to know what was the will of God, he always asked Claire at San Damiano's. From the start of his conversion, Francis had been torn between the desire of contemplation and the duty of preaching. Does the good Lord wish me to be a hermit or a missionary? Should I dedicate myself to a life of prayer in the woods and among the rocky hillsides? Or, I, or ought I to preach in the squares and the towns? 
does he call me to the contemplative life or the active life? Now and then, this doubt tormented him. In the solitude of the woods, where he felt the need and the sweetness and, con- and contemplation, as well as in the company of men, when he felt the satisfaction of spinning himself in charity for their salvation. To settle this doubt once for all and to clear it up, he wanted, to def- he wanted a definite sign on what the will of God was in his regard. Francis could indeed have asked directly to God, but instead he had recourse to Claire. She was a sure messenger of the will of the Lord. Francis called one of his companions, Brother Maceo, to himself and said, Brother, go along to Sister Claire and ask her to gather together her more spiritual nuns and to pray that the Lord might reveal to them what is better for me, to preach or to pray. Then go along to to Brother Sylvester and tell him the same thing. Brother Sylvester was the first priest among the friars and lived like a hermit on Mount Subasio. Because of this, Francis held him in, in, in great respect. respect. And by the way, Mount Sebastio was a long ways from Assisi, and it was there where Francis received, received the stigmata. Brother Maceo therefore went to San Damianos and made his message to Claire, who gathered her companions together in prayer before that same crucifix which had spoken to Francis. Then Brother Maceo went off to Mount Subasio in search of Father Sylvester. The first Franciscan priest had already had a vision from which he was already, he easily was able to deduce what was to be Francis's work. For instance, one day when he was praying, he saw a cross of gold come from the mouth of Francis. The cross became bigger and bigger until it embraced the whole world and reached to heaven. To him, this meant that the preaching of Francis would go out to the whole world leading men to heaven. The answer of Sylvester was crystal clear. This is what God says. You are to tell Father Francis, the Lord has not called you for yourself, but also for the souls that will be saved through you. Brother Maceo came down from the mountain and back to San Damiano. Claire also received an answer, and it was the same as Father Sylvester. Claire said, Tell Francis that God wishes him to preach in the world. When the brother eventually returned to Francis, Francis was much concerned after so long a journey. So he first washed his feet, dirty from the long walk, generally assisted him, prepared a table for his meal, and then in great humility served Brother Maceo. After the meal, he took Brother Maceo outside And then he knelt down before him, drew his hood over his head, and extended his arms in the form of a cross, and without seeking the answer of Claire and Sylvester, Francis said, What command did my Savior Jesus Christ give? For him, Claire and Sylvester were the mouthpieces of God. Brother Maceo answered, To Sister Claire and to Father Sylvester the Lord has revealed his will that you go through the world and preach, because he has not chosen you for yourself alone, but for the salvation of others. Francis rose from his knees and returned to the brothers. With great assurance, he then said to his companions, Let us go out in the name of God. He took his walking stick and went out. This story has been told through the centuries by the Franciscans in Assisi, and now you are hearing it. And hear it with the ears of your heart, with the, yes, hear it with the ears of your heart. To open your heart to this message of this, this it's, like a, it's really a teaching for us, how we need to pray for God's holy will. Discerning God's will is through prayer and scripture. It's by uh, consulting, uh, counseling with other people who are of, of deep faith, of deep prayer. That's why we have spiritual directors today or sp- spiritual companions, who, people we trust that we can share our innermost thoughts or reflections and ask for prayer, ask them for guidance. It's a beautiful, remarkable story of, of Claire, of Francis, of their obedience, of their love for God, of their respect for each other, 
And I am so impressed of the story. I never really knew of such depth between a man and a woman and spiritual friendship. Indeed, for St. Francis and St. Clair were, were very, very um, good companions for each other, helping each other reach heaven as dear friends. And Claire was the founder of the Poor Claire Sisters. Francis was the founder of the Franciscan Order. This was part two of our Assisi series. We visited uh, San Damiano. We visited the Basilica St. Clair. We met St. Clair. And now St. Clair wants to give you a jewel for the journey. And this is it. Blessed be you, O God, for having created me. You've noticed that many of, of Francis and, and Claire's prayers were included much of praise. So we too must include praise in our prayer. We too must thank God for, yes, having created us, for creating me, and to raise our minds to him and to, and to approach others, to ask them for their prayers and, and their counsel, uh, trusting, of course, in their wisdom. Well, friends, let us, let us close the prayer. This prayer is one asking Claire's intercession. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. God of mercy, you inspired St. Claire with the love of poverty. By the help of her prayers, may we follow you, Lord, in poverty of spirit and come to the joyful vision of your glory in the kingdom of heaven. O oh Lord, be a light to us in the sorrows and anxieties of this earthly life and lead us into the eternal light of our home in heaven. Amen. St. Clair and St. Francis, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. We've come to the end of our journey for today. Thank you for joining me on Journeys of Hope, and I welcome you to visit Pilgrim Center of Hope and learn about our threefold ministry of conferences, pilgrimages, and evangelization outreach. Visit pilgrimcenterofhope.org or call us at 210-521-3377. 210-521-3377. Fellow pilgrims, on behalf of Pilgrim Center of Hope, I want to thank you for journeying with me on this journey to Assisi. And because we are a pilgrim people, strive to live your journey of hope with boldness passion, and joy. Until next time, may God bless you. Journeys of Hope, a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Visit our website at pilgrimcenterofhope.org.